Hi, and welcome to Politics with Paint, where we take a look at the wonderful world of international conflicts. As you might have noticed, I'm standing here on this rock in the middle of nowhere. It is part of a group of islands which are the cause for a dangerous conflict involving China, Japan and Taiwan, which is not often discussed outside of East Asia. In Chinese, these islands are called the Diayu Islands, and the Japanese know them as the Senkaku Islands. They are located around here and on first glance they seem pretty unimportant. No inhabitants, no interesting features, right in the middle of nowhere. And they would be pretty unimportant if not for one thing, politics. Since the 1970s, these islands have caused a lot of diplomatic turmoil across East Asia, with some believing that this dispute could lead to a serious military confrontation between China and Japan in the future. Let's find out what's going on. The problem here is that China, Taiwan and Japan all disagree on which of them legally owns these islands. According to Japan, the islands are part of its southern Okinawa prefecture and de facto, Japan also controls the islands. Taiwan, however, claims that the islands belong to them, while China, well, China somewhat agrees with Taiwan, saying that the islands are part of Taiwan as well. But don't forget who owns Taiwan, according to China. Small hint, it's China. To understand where this disagreement comes from, we need to take a look at the history of the islands and the two narratives within that history. According to the Chinese and Taiwanese point of view, these islands have been part of China since at least the Middle Ages and mark the border between the Ming and later Qing dynasties of China and the Kingdom of Ryukyu, which was once an independent island kingdom. This kingdom would eventually be annexed by Japan in 1879 and become part of today's Okinawa prefecture. Anyway, the Chinese support the claim through a number of old maps and travelogues from between the 14th and 18th centuries, saying that these proved the islands to be rightful Chinese possessions. Fast forward to 1895 and Japan is fighting with the Chinese Qing dynasty in the First Sino-Japanese War. And the Chinese say that during this war Japan illegally annexed these islands. Soon after, China lost the war and the subsequent peace treaty forced it to cede some territory to Japan, most notably the island of Taiwan. This peace treaty did not mention the DRU Senkaku Islands as being ceded to Japan specifically. However, the Chinese say that the reason for this was that they were considered part of Taiwan. Also, China had some more pressing issues to tend to, like trying not to collapse. Therefore, some small and remote islands in the middle of nowhere weren't really the biggest problem. Fast forward again to 1945 and the end of the Second World War. Japan has been defeated and was occupied by Allied forces. In 1951, a formal peace treaty was signed, the Treaty of San Francisco, which forced Japan to renounce its claims to all illegally acquired overseas territories. This, of course, also included the island of Taiwan, which, according to the Chinese, should also include the DIU Senkaku Islands as a part of Taiwan. The Japanese, however, see things differently. According to them, the islands were never part of medieval China or the Kingdom of Ryukyu. Instead, the Japanese say that the islands were unclaimed before 1895, making them terra nullius, which is a fancy Latin term in international law, meaning no man's land. Annexing terra nullius is perfectly legal under international law and one of the few remaining ways how nations can legally acquire more land even today. However, finding unclaimed land today is rather difficult since we have modern satellite technology, but it can happen when rare natural events generate new landmass. This actually happened during an earthquake in 2013, which created a completely new tiny island just off the coast of Pakistan, but back to the topic. The point I'm trying to make is that the Japanese argue that their annexation of the islands was perfectly legal in regard to international law. That bit is quite important since it would entail that the islands would not be part of the illegally acquired territories which Japan was forced to return with the peace treaty of San Francisco. To support this claim, Japan points to a number of maps and geography textbooks produced in China and Taiwan between 1945 and 1970, depicting the islands as Japanese territory under the Japanese names. Furthermore, they refer to the DIU Senkaku Islands classification under the San Francisco Peace Treaty, which treated them as part of Japan's Okinawa Prefecture. Well, who is right here? I don't know. Decide for yourself. Anyway, since 1951 the islands were under US American administration together with the entirety of Okinawa in accordance to the San Francisco Peace Treaty. However, 20 years later, in 1971, the United States began preparing the return of the rest of the Okinawa prefecture to Japan and with it also the return of the DIU Senkaku Islands. 
This infuriated both China and Taiwan and their governments publicly lay claim on the islands in protesting their return to Japan. After some consideration, the United States decided to still return the islands to Japanese jurisdiction. Afterwards, there were some minor diplomatic incidents, but nothing really extraordinary, until the 1990s. Two things coincided in this period which turned the conflict from an obscure diplomatic disagreement to a major international issue. Firstly, the publics in China, Taiwan and Japan started to get much more involved, sometimes on their own, sometimes instigated by their own governments. Subsequently, nationwide protests and diplomatic incidents caused by activists became a fairly common phenomenon. Properties would get damaged, people injured and some activists would even lose their lives. In 1996, a 45-year-old Chinese activist from Hong Kong drowned in an attempt to swim to the island. Afterwards, activists from China, Taiwan and Japan would periodically attempt to reach the islands and raise their national flags there. More recently, in 2012, Massive anti-Japanese protests erupted across China's major cities after the Japanese government announced plans to purchase some of the disputed islands, which had so far been in private hands. Secondly, the balance of power in East Asia started to shift as China's economy began to grow rapidly, beginning to rival the economic powerhouse of Japan and even outgrow it in 2011. China's policy regarding the conflict became much more assertive, particularly after Japan nationalized the islands in 2012, seeing an unprecedented rise in incidents between Chinese and Japanese naval forces within the territorial waters of the DRU Sikaku Islands. This alone would be pretty dangerous enough, but China and Japan not only confront each other in the ocean, but also in the skies. In 2013, the conflict made international headlines again when China announced the implementation of the so-called East China Sea Air Defense Identification Zone. What made this action so controversial is that it extends over the entirety of the DRU Senkaku Islands, therefore significantly overlapping with the Japanese Air Defense Identification Zone. What followed was a steady increase in incidents over the DRU Senkaku Islands, where Chinese and Japanese military planes would get dangerously close to each other. Until now we have talked mostly about China and Japan so far, but where is Taiwan in all of this? Well, Taiwan takes a more cautious approach, and for good reasons. First of all, yes, size matters, especially in international politics, and Taiwan is quite a bit smaller than China and Japan. Smaller population, smaller military and smaller economy. Therefore, it cannot compete with the two titans of East Asia at the same level. Second, the conflict over the dear use in Kaku Islands puts Taiwan into a really awkward situation. To be very brief, you could say that Taiwan is viewed by China as a slightly rebellious province, which has been de facto independent from mainland China since 1945. And since then, China worked relentlessly to undermine any Taiwanese aspirations for independence and seeking to reunify the island with the rest of China, of course under the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party. For Taiwan, the issue surrounding the DRU Senkaku Islands is therefore linked with the question of its own sovereignty. And although Taiwan's territorial claims are supported by China, simply cooperating with its communist counterpart across the strait is not a viable option if Taiwan wants to secure its de facto independence. For this purpose, Taiwan urgently needs to keep its allies, among which Japan is extremely important. Both are part of the same semi-official system of alliances in the Asia-Pacific, which are led by the United States with the goal to contain Chinese influence in the region and to secure Taiwan's de facto independence. Taking a firm anti-Japanese position means to alienate an important ally in the region and to move towards less independence in favor of Beijing's foreign policy. However, taking a firm anti-China position would also come at great cost for Taiwan, as it would look like the Taiwanese government is trading its territorial integrity and historical right to the DRU Senkaku Islands for strategic gain. Therefore, it is not surprising that Taiwan has refrained from criticizing both China and Japan too much when incidents occur. But, long ago, somebody wise said, when two people quarrel, a third rejoices. Taiwan uses this situation to improve its relations with China while at the same time negotiating smaller compromises with Japan on, for example, fishing rights, but also to smooth tensions with an important ally. So far, we have looked at the claims to the dear using Kaku Islands and how the conflict has developed. But there is still one question left which needs to be answered. Why? Why are these little barren islands in the middle of nowhere worth all this trouble? Well, if you ask me, the answer to this question has three dimensions. 
economic, strategic and symbolic. First, the economic dimension. The deer used in Kako Islands may be uninhabited and barren, however, that does not mean that they have no economic value at all. The most significant economic factor is the existence of oil and gas fields in the waters surrounding the islands, as first suggested by United Nations report back in 1969. Apart from this, the presence of rich fishing grounds is also something not to be underestimated in their economic value. This is particularly true for China, Taiwan and Japan, all of which consume fairly high quantities of seafood. Also, owning islands in general is a great way to secure many kinds of resources as they can massively expand the nation's so-called Exclusive Economic Zone, short EEZ. This zone is in up to 200 nautical miles radius around a piece of land in which only the nation which owns this piece of land has the exclusive rights to the area's natural resources. And if you are a nation with a lot of isolated islands, like for instance the British, you can have an EEZ much larger than just your mainland will get you alone. Therefore, legally owning the deer used in Kaku Islands could have a significant impact on the Free Nations EEZ, although it should be noted that it is not quite clear if the deer used in Kaku Islands actually classify its islands in accordance to the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. According to its definition, only landmasses capable of sustaining human habitation or economic life are considered islands with an EEZ. Next, we come to the strategic reasons behind the conflict. For this, let's look at the map of East Asia first. The map shows us that China has a geographical problem, as its access to the sea can easily be restricted by controlling a number of choke points in the Pacific. Wendover Production has an excellent video explaining this issue in detail, link in the description. Basically, this means that in the event of an armed conflict, China could lose its vital access to the seas. Controlling the DIUs in Kaku Islands could ease this problem for China at least a little bit. At the same time, losing control over the islands would weaken Japan's position too, as in the event of a military confrontation, China could more easily disrupt Japan's access to vital energy exports from the Middle East, which pass the nearby waters. Lastly, let's examine the symbolic dimension. I guess it's fair to say that the relationship between China, Taiwan and Japan is, to put it mildly, difficult. The events of the 19th and 20th centuries had a large impact on how these nations see each other and it's no bloody wonder. In mainland China, as well as in Taiwan, people suffered much during the past Japanese imperial expansions between 1895 and 1945, and this decade-long suffering has been burned into the Chinese consciousness and still influences how many Chinese people view Japan and its actions today. Both Chinese and Taiwanese officials have stated that they haven't seen sufficient efforts on Japan's part to apologize for its crimes, and that it hasn't come to terms with its past. They feel that Japan hasn't recognized its guilt enough and that actions such as claiming the DIUs in Kaku Islands are indicative of that. At the same time, many Japanese feel that these accusations are unjust, believing that Japan has apologized enough and atoned for its actions with reparations, development aid and other means of help. To some, it also seems that Japan's recent past is being exploited to weaken their nation by questioning its territorial integrity. Furthermore, this conflict has also symbolic importance for the relationship between China and Taiwan. For China, this conflict is a way to show the Taiwanese that the communist government in Beijing is fighting for the territorial integrity of all of China. And by taking a tough stance against Japan, China hopes to gain support from the Taiwanese public and government, which could bring them closer to unification under Beijing's rule. We should also not forget that the DIUs in Kaku Islands are by no means the only territorial dispute with which China and Japan have to deal with. Should China and Japan compromise on this one issue, others could come knocking fairly quickly. For all these reasons, the conflict around the DIU Sinkaku Islands is unlikely to be resolved anytime soon. I hope this video helped you to understand this issue, and if you like to see similar videos on other conflicts, just leave a comment. Thank you for watching Politics with Paint.